All right, so yeah, here we go. Okay, so welcome to Dojo Talks. This is the part two, or discussion, on coaching philosophy. Uh, last episode, we did a part one on this topic where we discussed a bunch of stuff about our own personal philosophies when it comes to coaching. If you missed that one, you can find it on YouTube or any of the uh, big podcast apps. Uh, but for today, we're just gonna be continuing the discussion because we had like a bunch of questions left over from last time. Um, that we all kind of threw in threw in there. And so the way this will work is one person will just throw out a question or a, uh, a statement of opinion, and the other two will be free to agree or disagree with it, and we'll just kind of see where the conversation goes. Um, so let me start with, let me throw it to, to David to get, start us off with uh, first first topic. What do you got for us? All right, those who watched the first part probably already know where I stand on this uh, statement, but I'll just throw it out to you all neutrally for your opinions. Uh, teachers should prepare extensively for their lessons. So, so this is something you, you definitely believe. <laughs> Good guess, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you wanna give us your, your take first. My take first, yeah. okay. <laughs> all right, well, um, so as as you know, I think like for lessons, I mean, this could get very long. So you guys just cut me off if if you need to. But, um, you know, I think for a lesson to be good, it has to be kind of individualized. And so, you know, for that to be the case, you have to like know your students games and your strengths and weaknesses. You know, for most lessons that I do, like both myself and my student are expected to be putting in work. And so that means I have to check my students work if they're doing you know, homework or of various kinds. So that's some time and I have to, you know, hopefully they're active players and I have to check the games that they've been playing. And then I have to think about it all the time, what I want to do uh, with them, because you, I think that you've got a lot of different options as a teacher, um, or you may often miss the wrong options. So just as you can think a lot about a chess position, like in theory, you could just keep thinking on and on about it. I think you can keep thinking on and on about what's the next move with a with a particular student. So, I do that. Yeah, Jesse, okay, how about well, you? Yeah, do you? Well, agree? yeah, I'll go next just because I'm diametrically opposed. Not because I have a problem with it, but mostly just the teaching that I do and believe in, where I'm going over a student's games. Um, yes, I sometimes look at the game that they submit to me, though they don't always, you know, different students have different ways of submitting a game to me. Um, but we are simply reviewing their games 95% of the time. So um, I am not doing a, a whole lot of thinking around the edges of the game itself. And then the topics that we discuss for improvement beyond the game itself will just arise from the game. So, you know, I might show some positions and put links to games or other things based on the game that we're looking at, but it definitely arises organically out of the analysis that we do. So um, I think if, you, if you're if you doing somebody like with lesson, if you have ideas of like lesson plans and certain things you want to do, that speaks to me if you have a teaching which is based on uh, you know, not going over students' games, and then I get it. It's a totally different uh, program of teaching and and working. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. So I'm I'm probably with David on this one. I definitely feel like there's no limit to how much I could prepare for a student. If they have games I can look at, I can always like kind of look deeper at their games or look deeper at the types of positions they're playing, so that I kind of understand them better, and I can come up with like kind of more examples to show them of like high level chess. Um, so yeah, for me, I have to like cut myself off when it comes to prep time for a student. Cause if I have a lesson at like, I don't know, 3 p.m. on a day, I could literally spend the whole day like <laughs> prepping for the lesson if I'm not if I'm not careful, which is not good. There's lots of other things <laughs> I could be doing. I'm only gonna get like one hour um, with the student. But I always enjoy that kind of feeling when it's like, you know, I'm like rushing to get everything into that one hour because there's like, honestly not enough uh, time in, in the day. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think it's um, just a matter of finding some kind of uh, balance. I think something like an hour per like class kind of always made sense to me as like a, 
the base point. I don't know, I think the more you understand about your student, the more you can kind of help kind of narrow down like exactly where they need your, uh, your help as, uh, as a coach. Um, and yeah, but I don't know. I try to prepare stuff for students that I can then use for other students. So I try not to like just have to do like a whole set of work each time for each student. If I can use the same example for multiple people, then I think that's just kind of efficient. Um, but yeah, do you guys yeah. reuse examples when you're when you're teaching? If you're teaching a lot of students, it becomes more possible to do some reusing and you've got more material at your fingertips like that. So Yeah, and it's also like, well, this is the best game to teach this topic. And like <laughs> these three students need to learn, you know, how to exactly. put pressure on a single weakness, how to convert against like, uh, or like with like an extra pawn on the queen side. Um, this kind of thing though yeah. actually yeah nowadays one of my favorite activities is to just like find kind of like instructive classics <laughs> that aren't in the books because I feel like those can be really uh, really cool okay cool well let's go so why don't you do your question well hang on let me okay. let me just let me just <laughs> try and contradict Jesse a little bit okay so you know just make That's it fine. maybe a little more spicy but um I I teach plenty of lessons where the focus is my students game. And, and mm -hmm. I often have students practice annotating their games and bringing it to me. And we talk about it and stuff like that. So it's not like the only thing I do, but I spend plenty of time doing the same kind of activity that Jesse describes. And I still think that, you know, you should look at the students game before the lesson. You should look at their annotations before the lesson, if they send them to you in advance. And, you know, sometimes you can, look through somebody's annotation and within like two minutes, you know where you want to go with the lesson, but not every time. So um, I think having that time of looking at it in advance will often improve the lesson. Often you'll know, okay, we just need to talk about the situation around move 16 or this situation here. Um, or in advance, I realize something to work on and then I can go find the material because me, for example, I'm not as fast at finding material. Everybody's got different strengths and weaknesses as teachers, right? So like if I'm like, oh, my student needs like a game of this kind, like I don't have one of those memories where I'm like, oh yeah, 1963, so-and-so versus so-and-so, right? Like it may take me a while to find some good examples to, to fill in what we wanna work on coming out of that. Um, and then oftentimes somebody will annotate a game and they'll try and make comments about every single move in the game and we've only got an hour, right? And some of it is just like extraneous. And all I have to say is like, you don't need to annotate moves two through five in this game or something like that, right? But um, having looked at it in advance helps me just focus in on, okay, we're gonna talk about these three moments and these three comments that they made. Yeah. Okay. I mean, actually I, I have some students that are awesome because they'll analyze their games and they'll even just send me like specific questions <laughs> we got to talk about this moment where i didn't know what to do this moment where i didn't know what to do and this moment where i blundered and then it actually kind of reduces my time but then i'm able to like prepare specifically for like the most important question so yeah i don't know i think there's as always uh, a balance to uh to this stuff yeah that's great and i try and you know coach my students in that direction so that they have some idea what are the key moments you know if I mean, it's it's awesome if your student can 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 point you to that, right? And that that in itself is something for them to learn, to do about the art of of working and studying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I will do the next uh, the next topic here. Um, and yeah, this is actually a question I just recently started to think about because of the extended nature of the pandemic. <laughs> but do you guys prefer? to teach someone in person over a physical board uh, or maybe using a mix of like a board and a computer if you need to uh, or do you prefer to to teach online because uh, for me i think when i started the pandemic at first i was actually kind of excited to move everything online i just felt like okay now it's going to be super efficient i can just teach from home it's like i got all my lessons um and yeah, I don't have like a great memory either actually, David, but what I do have is just like a lot of databases of stuff, right? That I can kind of reuse. It's not organized in the best possible way, but I think if it is, that could be really useful <laughs> for, for a coach. 
Um, but yeah, lately I've actually just been missing just like sitting across from from a student like with a board and just like moving the pieces around. And somehow I feel like you don't get the same feeling of whether a student understands something when you're working with them like virtually, uh, even if you're using video, um, as like when they're just kind of sitting in front of you and you can just kind of interact with them, I think, in a little bit more... Um, physical way. So what do you guys think? Do you miss over the board lessons? Uh, okay, I'll go first. Um, I think um, that it varies a lot on whom I'm teaching. I think the move to online has mostly been beneficial, especially just in structuring my own time. And as a student myself, somebody who's taking lessons, the ability to have so many people in the world teach me amazing the ability to make it precisely at a time so i don't have to like travel somewhere cuts down so much grief where i do think uh, it's a difference is uh, i do not want to teach younger kids online i think it's a real problem so i think that's where a lot of suffering happens i do have some younger students but mm, i'd say somewhere around the age of 20 12 or something, you're getting a, a barrier for some kids different than others. But younger than that, where the really talented kids really do need help, I think it's very difficult for me as a coach to gauge where the kid is, if the kid's mind is there. You know, uh, I don't like that. There, I'm just like, <laughs> I, I need to see exactly what the kid's looking at. You know, I need to, you know, have the kid touch the pieces and, and that. But other than that, I think it's mostly been a huge benefit to be online. Okay, cool. What about you, David? Yeah, I mean, already pre-pandemic, you know, I taught online pretty often in, in the past. So I, I'd already had the comparison for many years. I think online, like you mentioned, there are some things that are more efficient, like just like loading a game into a board and like clicking through it and um, just having access to everything. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do really efficiently um jesse i agree with him that with younger students like a lot of younger people it sort of drops off their engagement on online and on zoom and something like that so um and people have seen the same thing with teaching in schools right with distance learning that you know from my from my, from my own experience you know in middle school something like 80 percent of the students are just fine with switching to online learning and about 20% really suffer. And if you go younger to like kindergarten, it's kind of the other way around, like 20% of kindergartners can handle doing distance learning and 80% of them are just like, what's going on, you know, bouncing off the wall or glazed over or whatever. And so it, there's some curve between the two. Um, I consider myself a decent mind reader when it comes to my students and chess players in general. And that's an important component when you're teaching is they're not gonna say their whole thought process out loud, but you can often think, okay, now they're realizing this. Now they're like wondering about that. Mm -hmm. And you can definitely mind read better in person than on the internet, especially if a student like turns off their camera or something, then it's really tough to know where they're at. What are they struggling with? How are they feeling? Do they need more time or do they need to be pushed to give an answer now? And stuff like that it can be really tough so you can lose you can lose time on that. And then the last thing I would just mention is I think it's more fun to do stuff with a real board and with real people. So insofar as fun helps inspire you, I think something's lost by doing it online. Like I feel myself yearning to sit at a chessboard with another person, whether it's, you know, to play a game with, with a peer or to teach a student or mm -hmm. to, you know, to talk about a game that's been played together, to go over like when we had the GM house, right, we'd set up a board and we'd play through the games from the super term instead of each being at home watching on some some chess website. Right. Yeah. 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 yeah every morning we would get together and, you know, play through some game as it's coming out. So I, I really miss that. And I think that that's sort of like a loss of, of, of fun, maybe that has some impact. Maybe as a footnote, I'll add uh, and something I'm I'm really discovering as a coach with my students coming back to playing is the difference in quality for their learning and appreciation of the game between them playing online versus playing over the board dramatic more dramatic than i would have guessed even 
And that's both anecdotal from them telling me that and also me seeing the quality of the games. In particular, when they play games online, when I look at their opponents, their opponents are all moving instantly, whether it's a game 45 or a game 30. And I, you know, chess.com shows you exactly how long or Lee Chess, exactly how long they thought. They're not thinking at all because their mind is on Twitter or whatever it else it is. <laughs> so I think that is a huge difference that's very interesting uh, that I would say coaches and my previous self, you know, be good to have in mind that you really need to push that. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty incredible. The difference differences in just like playing chess online versus over the board. And I think one of the unrealized advantages of over the board chess is that you're absolutely forced to focus because like you're not allowed to have your phone on. You're not allowed to look at any screens. You like you can't multitask, can't do anything else while you're playing. You're discouraged from like eating, you know, <laughs> at the board. Right. It's like right. really it's just like you and the game like full focus for four or five hours. And then online chess, it's like, and the interesting thing is that even all the like world's best players, they all say the same thing. It's like, it's hard to focus for more than like five, 10 minutes on, on one game. Like it's really, really not even close to, to the same. Uh, it's so much faster online. And so I can only imagine what it's like for people. It's like uh, only used to playing like rapid games, G30 at like the maximum and then having to like transition to OTB which is much longer um, or for like OTB players to get some kind of like practice and experience these days uh, without being able to play OTB I think it's a real it's a real challenge um, but yeah OTB players are also committed right like they've mm -hmm. probably paid an entry fee maybe they've driven somewhere maybe they you know maybe they're spending a lot of money on a hotel and stuff so like they're just automatically serious because they've invested more to be there yeah or even if you go down to like your local club and play one game a week or um you know i think when you meet up and you train with someone over the board i think you're likely to do more than if you're just on your own so mm -hmm. i just feel like yeah there's um also something about i don't know something nice about the seeing chess in a different in multiple uh dynamics like somehow I feel like working over the board and then also seeing at, uh, seeing some positions on a screen and like maybe seeing the same position on a 2D board and a 3D board, I feel like that kind of helps, I don't know, somehow, just like seeing the same thing, but kind of multiple um, ways. Because I definitely feel like if I'm working with the screen too much, I sit down at the board and it's like I haven't calculated in months. <laughs> and not so much vice versa, but it, like when I was first starting out like using a screen, like. Yeah, it definitely felt very different than calculating OTB. So something about, I don't know, using a combination feels uh, at least somewhat interesting to me. Um, but yeah, it is well, very efficient now to work uh, online. I think the point Jesse made about um, it being different with kids really makes sense. I think kids have a harder time with online learning, it seems. Uh, okay, well then, shall we move on to the next question? Yeah, let's do the next question. Uh, so this is a question I have. I feel kind of strongly about it, but I think it's a, actually a controversial thing. So question is, do you think physical fitness matters? And if you do, I guess, as a coach, you kind of have to be pushing it on your students. Um, I feel strongly that it does, and I'm going to explain why. But I do know that, for example, Augard in his book is like, no, nah, it's not going to help you. Even though that guy's kind of a physical fitness nut himself, he's like, no, that's not going to help you. So uh, I do feel strongly about it. And one of the reasons I asked is I kind of want to just throw it out there for discussion. So um, the, the main intuition behind this is partly my own experience and as, as a player trying to improve and that myself trying to improve and then also students trying to improve generally especially if they're a little older, they're at some kind of plateau and they need to reach a critical escape velocity to get out of that plateau. And what physical fitness does, I think two things. One, first of all, the main thing, I, I'm just gonna preach here for a second about physical fitness. The hardest thing to do is to eat well. And what eating well will do 
not drinking, for example, will give you mental clarity, a higher mental clarity than you had before. And that's a, a small but very significant step to thinking better and improving and presumably also sleeping better, which is gonna be part of physical fitness anyway. Sleeping, eating right, very key, I think, to uh, chess improvement. And then the other part of my intuition on this is that there's kind of a feeling of physical well being and ex expansiveness that comes about when you are improving your fitness level, especially with things like maybe weightlifting or pushing some kind of barrier uh, in your physical being and, you know, pushing yourself to some kind of limit. There's a kind of uh, tension in the body that's held that feels empowering. And it maybe it's a false confidence, but it's nevertheless a kind of confidence that you're gonna need, I think. And I just, again, mostly speaking from my own experience, uh, you're gonna need when you face, you know, the strong opponents who are gonna put a lot of pressure on you. So that's my two cents. I'll just throw it over to you guys. Yeah, well, I think um, one thing that sounds very important to me, and I have, I have you know, just very, basic understanding of of how anything outside chess works right but one thing that makes a lot of sense to me is this idea of confidence i think confidence is very important if you're trying to improve your chess play and be stronger players because during a game you're kind of like you're often like battling with yourself you see certain ideas you don't know what's going to work what doesn't work certain ideas are riskier than others and if you're lacking confidence you're, I think, less likely to make the critical moves that you might be seeing in favor of, let's say, safer choices. Um, and you might also be spending more time, right, to kind of like double check your calculations, even though, you know, you already know you can play a move, but you spend an extra five minutes on it, that ends up adding up in the end when you're in time trouble and then not playing as well. So I feel like confidence is a really important thing, actually, in, in a chess game. Uh, and it, to me, it feels like working on your fitness and your nutrition definitely helps with your like mental confidence. So if that connection is there, if that all that holds up, then to me, it feels like a yeah, really easy way to kind of like improve your form. Um, I don't think it's the most important thing. And I would say it's probably just kind of depends on the person how much it can help. But I think it helps to some extent, whether it's like, 5% or like 30% for me, totally impossible um, to say. But it sounds like there is something there. In, in the sense that chess itself, it's like you're, you're performing. There are days where you play better and there are days where you play worse. Mm. And I think we definitely don't understand the factors that go into what makes someone play, you know, like a genius one day and like a total more on like the other because there are all these stories of people being like sick and then they had the tournament of their life or like they were going through a really rough time in their personal life and they had like a great tournament like uh that's definitely happened for me so it's like uh you know it i don't think we fully understand all those factors but i feel like being a healthier person overall and having just having more energy right for like a four or five six hour chess game to me makes a lot of sense um would be helpful. But I don't talk about it with my students because I'm not an expert. <laughs> they ask about it. I'll tell them like, yeah, you should try to get sleep before a tournament. Maybe sleep is one of the more important things and you should try to eat well uh, if you can. But yeah, I try not to preach on it because I don't really know. Well, for my part, I can't imagine what the counter argument would be. Somebody who's like, no, no, it's better to be in bad shape for your tournaments. So I'm just going to say, yes, physical fitness matters. You should be fit. I think the counter argument is that it doesn't matter. Not that it's bad, but that it would not matter. And I think yeah. there are people out there who say that, which I, I just, to me, it makes no sense. But I, it's a prevalent enough argument that I'm like, wait, we have to talk about this one, you know? Yeah. yeah, I don't know if well, it's I mean, true almost... that. Um, sorry, I don't know if it's true if, that uh, Augard is against it because he has some sections in his books on like nutrition and. Not not against it, but he's like it's not going to help you. Dude. It's not going to help you. It's a, it's an illusion to think it's going to help you. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. 
right. I guess it was in which case as a coach, then, then forget about it. You know, you know why push it, but uh, yeah. So I don't push it much, but I, if you know, I, I'll push it for sure. Hmm. Yeah. I, I think it'll help you in every aspect of your life. And hmm. I mean, if, if the argument needs to be made for chess, I mean, almost every chess player who I've known for an extended period of time has at some point explained a mistake of theirs by saying that, you know, they were feeling like tired or low energy by that point in the game or something like that. So, right. I mean, if you're running out of physical reserves during your games, yeah, right. illusion seems pretty obvious. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. all I got. But if you're not okay. running out of physical reserves during your games, then I think you should be working harder during the games. <laughs> you should be pushing yourself more. Um, well, cool. It sounds like we're more or less in agreement on on this one. Um, all right, David, do you want to go with your another another question? Sure. My next question to you guys is: When should you when should you as the teacher or coach stop lessons with a student? Hmm cut them off. That's it. Do you have any particular thoughts on this one? You want me to answer my own question first? Again? <laughs> well, I feel like sometimes it's like you have your own pitch, like you've been thinking about it, you have some idea, you know? Yeah, yeah, of course, I've thought about everything. But <laughs> I mean, I'm asking you. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> we can go for me. It's uh, not not black and white. It's it's like kind of like a gray area. But um, yeah, if I find that I'm not super excited for a student's progress, then I'll probably uh, try to look for a way to uh, to cut it off, um, or or get like re excited, but one way or the other. Um, if if I feel like a student, I don't know, is not like fully into the lessons themselves, and is just kind of doing it out of inertia, uh, and I feel like it's not really productive, then I'd rather uh, just not do it. Um, I would say that's kind of the, the main factor, but yeah, it's hard to say exactly when that moment is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would say, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's funny, like some, one thing I think most coaches will tell you is that some students are easier to teach than others. And sometimes you leave a particular student every time you're just like drained, man just totally trained, just like, and um, sometimes it's not necessarily bad to be drained, but I, I feel like there's a lot of students who are really down on themselves. And then the lesson becomes a little bit of a therapy session, which is fine, but that can be draining. But the times, the, the only time I really feel like, oh man, this has got to stop is um, when I'm teaching a student who is taking the lessons out of some kind of ulterior factor. For example, their parents want me to teach the kid, you know, Mm -hmm. or maybe the kid's kind of into it, but the parents are the ones putting the money behind it. So the student doesn't even have really the pain of the money. So it's like whatever showing up here every week, Um, that can be a real drag. And I think, especially, you know, I've been teaching so long, I did, the i have done a lot of like camps and stuff and camps can be great but a lot of those kids are just not there for the chess and then it becomes like oh man just get me away from there man and and most recently i was in st louis and they had the gm in residence do like this sunday gig where they teach kids whose parents just dropped them off man oh it was nail biting man i just i was like ready to kill myself at the end of each one of those sessions it was just daycare and i just like i couldn't do it man i couldn't do it so that's the kind of thing that for my own i think david's asking more for the interests of the student and for me or for you i'm doing mostly by self-interest like if i stop enjoying it you're not going to get much i don't think they're going to get much out of it anyway if but I'm as a teacher, I am driven by somebody who's interested in their own uh, path forward. That's the thing that, you know, nowadays, too. Now, I I have so many people asking me for lessons and I just talk turning most people down and they have it's almost like they have to pitch me. They're like, oh, I got this plan, man. Here it is. Um, And then I'll be into it, you know, and if I'm into it, then I don't think I'm ever going to like stop taking lessons with that student. 
Yeah, there is right. a there is an opportunity cost nowadays because like yeah, if you're working one on one with someone, that's time that you're not spending like teaching the community or like making right. videos, making content. Um, right. Which uh, actually, I think I heard David make this point a long time ago um, that like you know you'd rather be teaching thousands of people with one lesson than one person. Yeah, so it's like you really have to care about that one student to make it uh, worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah. And I teach very few private lessons now. I mean, you guys can just check the dojo schedule to see how many or how few because I do every single lesson I do on dojo. So uh, I do make sure that every lesson I do reaches, you know, a couple hundred people at least instead of one. Um, you guys gave a lot of the good reasons that I'd thought of before, right? If uh, you're not excited as the teacher, that's a very, very bad sign. You got to examine that and either change things or or, or drop it, right? Um, Jesse mentioned one of the absolute worst is when the kid doesn't want to be there and their parents like want them to take lessons. Oh, no. Oh, oh my no, goodness. Man. A student who doesn't even want a lesson? <laughs> that makes two of us. Goodbye. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's been, you know, an insta goodbye for me since I was since I was a kid, you know, and, and needed the money, but no, just, just no. Cause it, cause I just felt like it's hurting the kid. Actually, it's hurting their relationship to chess, right. To be put in a situation they don't want to be and having a negative association with chess. And as you guys know, that's the number one for me. Right. So I'm never going to like do a lesson that's hurting my, my students relationship with chess. So that that's always been straight away out the window. Um, and then uh, and then a tricky one is like, let's say you're giving the students work to do and they're mm -hmm. not doing that work or like some week they do the work and the next week they don't. Right. Yeah. Like like where where is that situation going? And that could fall into one of these other camps that you guys mentioned where like at some point you're not digging it and, you know, you realize, oh, you know, maybe it's because you've you're wondering how much they care, how much they're taking it seriously. Or I think Jesse alluded to maybe if like the student's not able to make progress anymore, um, that could be like a damper. But, but, but how do you guys feel about a student not doing uh, the work that you're assigning or agreeing to together? The work I assign to my students is always like mutual, right? So it's not even like I told them to do something that they didn't wanna do. It's like, we talk together figure out what they should be doing, agree on it. And then let's say they don't do it. That's like when my kids say like, I want pasta, I cook pasta, I put it on the table. They're like, no, I want pizza. Uh -huh. Right. It's like, you You're have the pasta. <laughs> you asked for like three exercises and then you didn't do them. Right. So. <laughs> Um, well, okay, but David, your kids are like three years old, so I'm not uh, assigning homework <laughs> to them. <laughs> but no, no, I just I just give them food. That was just the parallel. Right, right, right. but um, yeah, I think it just depends on the student, and if uh, they do the work some of the time, then I just kind of see it as like a challenge. Like, okay, clearly they're they're happy to work on chess to some degree. It's just we have to find the right kind of like homework or or training for them to to be doing. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, for the most part, it's not really something uh, I've struggled with because I, I do try to keep the homework to be very, like, very doable, like not not challenging. Like you're just working on this one thing and that's it. And it's like pretty straightforward. Um, but yeah, if a student just like doesn't do it at all, then yeah, that's a sign that it's like, OK, not really, not really going to be working out. Actually, David, I think from my own, my it's actually at first I didn't really have any traction with the question, but for my own like critique of what I'm doing with my life and stuff, you know, um, something I've definitely suffered from as a teacher is I, I really do believe in going over your own games as the path forward, but it's so hard. It's so hard that the uh, failure rate of people following through on it uh, amongst my students as well. And these are people who knew going in that that's what I would want from them. The failure rate is so high because it's so hard that I have become lenient and maybe I should be, dude. I was being like, 
I cooked you pasta. Now you will eat the pasta. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, it's funny, actually, the kid analogy, you know, I identify with it because I have the same problem. And, And if you cook something and I have to not only spend the money on the pasta and the time, and then I got to throw it away. Oh, that's going to hurt. That's going to yeah. really hurt. And there's a little element of that too with, and I've been very lenient and, right. and arguably that's a point at which I've always been a poor schoolmaster. You know, I've been not the most stern person, uh, but maybe that's a point that I should reflect on and being uh, more diligent with. Right. I mean, to keep writing the analogy that Costa can't identify with, like uh-huh. you reach a point there where you're like, well, I'm going to cook for the neighbors instead of for you. Right. And you guys are just going to like watch yeah. the neighbors eat until you like, you know, realize what this is worth. Yeah. And for me, I think, I think if a student's not doing what they ordered, right. Cause, cause with me, it's not like I'm imposing this and same with my kids. I ask them, what do you want to eat? You know, it's not right, like I right. tell them like today we're all eating something mm-hmm. I know they don't like. Right. I mean, right. For me, if the if the students not doing the work that they're kind of picking and agreeing to within about two weeks of that, you know, I have to really question, shouldn't I just be teaching this other person who's sending me these heartfelt, like, you know, pleading, passionate (laughs) entreaties for lessons, Um, you know? um, Yeah, so so I think really within like two to three weeks i'm thinking like well you know maybe just maybe just switch to another to another student Mm -hmm. that's kind of like where i am on that one but that's definitely like a gray area i mean i'll have like a fantastic student who doesn't do something some week that's that's fine i don't even really like blink if it's one time but it's two to three times um in a short period of time then then i really have to wonder right if it wouldn't be better to go with someone else and this brings me to my last reason to end lessons with a student, which neither of you mentioned yet, which is just, if you feel like you've, you've done something good for that student and uh, there's somebody else waiting who deserves a turn also, Hmm. I think then it can be an absolute no fault breakup. You know, it's not that your teaching wasn't working. It's not that the student wasn't doing the work. It's not that you weren't both having fun, but like you've done something good together and uh, you know, now somebody else gets a turn. Yeah. And that's something that I've been considering a lot recently because, you know, I've got these requests and I'm like, oh, you know, like I've never taught this person, this other person I've given 10 lessons to maybe, maybe like this person deserves a turn, you know, and I always want to bring it to like a good conclusion, finish a set of lessons, finish a unit or whatever. But, um, yeah, I think like, I think like every now and then I just have to like cycle it now. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. Sometimes you just achieve your goal with the coach. Actually, I I don't know if you guys know, but I worked with Elshon to get my third IM norm. I was like stuck at like 2380 and two norms. And then we worked for like maybe a few months or so just until I got like over 2400. And then there was just kind of like, okay, now like I'll take a break, figure out what like where to go from there. But yeah, it was kind of like a nice, like succinct uh, coaching relationship. So that definitely makes sense as well. Guys, I feel like, uh, you know, people always ask, and I don't know what to say on your behalf. We should probably say if we're even, what's our current status when it comes to taking on students. Uh, because for me, I'm basically not accepting any students at this moment, September 27th. Um, Uh but if I do, I'm just too busy just working on like so many different things right now. And I have a few students, uh, left over, but, um, if I do decide to open things up, I will let the community know (laughs) in some way or another. Uh, what about you guys? It's got to come with a really good story at this point. And I'm, I'm honestly, I'm just too stretched thin. I'm just too strike. Yeah, no, honestly, guys, my day is begins at 6 a.m. and it really lasts until nine almost every day and i need i need a break man and i need more time for myself like i carve out a little time for my own study i think it's very important uh but i don't have enough of that for myself and i i feel like that's also important we talked about that last time also very important if you're going to coach to be trying to improve yourself you know 
so yeah i need i need time for myself <laughs> yeah okay yeah and i'm just i don't know feeling guilty coast i don't know exactly where i am i've got these like requests and i really want to teach yeah. everybody and i can't do it so i don't know i think i mean yeah We'll, we'll see. It's also like we just got back into the school year, so we'll see if my time expands a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. Well, I was wondering myself because people are always asking me during the streams, like, "Hey, are either any of you guys like taking lessons?" Mm. And I'm always just like, "Oh, you got to message David and Jesse." Yeah. <laughs> but but I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I'm happy to just say like we're very busy. <laughs> Yeah, you could say that. I usually do the same thing as you. I say Jack Kosti and Jesse. That's right. Yeah, actually, you know, and I have, um, I have, I do have uh, friends. Like, actually, a mutual friend of me and David, um, Jason Stone King. I've been. He, he's like a lot of people come to me and they're lower rated, and I just send them to him, and he's been doing great, and so that's been cool. And I think there's some people in the dojo. I want to start referring to them too. Yeah, Evan uh, Rosenberg just started teaching. Exactly. And so there are definitely people that if you, people write to me, even if I can't do it myself, I will try to refer them to somebody. So there's that. Cool. Cool. Yeah. All right, cool. So what's your next question, buddy? Okay. So this is something I think I've actually been thinking about this one for like <laughs> a couple of years. Um, but I, I don't think coaches should spend time during the lessons on stuff that the student can easily and in many cases should be doing on their own. So for me, the classic example of this is like the bishop and knight checkmate. Like this is something that someone could learn with like an online lesson or like a million different YouTube videos. Uh, and I remember seeing a lesson where like a coach was like teaching the end game to a student like over the board and it took them like the whole hour, you know, and it was just like, it just didn't seem like the best use of time. So it's oh, not I'm the worst. Fight you on this one. Yeah. Yeah, it's not the worst thing a coach can do, like the bishop and knight endgame. Uh, but to me, it's just like if it's something that the student, because it's not even just like they can learn it on their own. The other thing is like they have to practice on their own, right? They have to just play it out against the computer mm -hmm. and drill it and and like make sure that they can do it. And it's like, yeah, I think the coach can be used for so many more useful things than this like analyzing their games. I think that's something that like only uh, a coach <laughs> can really do. They can't get that in like a YouTube video or, uh, you know, online drill. Okay, well, good. I'm glad we have a controversy. I totally disagree. <laughs> Bishop and Knight, let's use the Bishop and Knight as an example. Um, first of all, even if you don't believe you're gonna get the Bishop and Knight, which you will, uh, I do think it's important as a training tool for visualization. My sense is that people who watch an, a video once, twice, thrice, they're still not gonna be able to do it. It's gonna take a lot of practice and uh, some explaining, uh, going into some positions about what to do when. And then, not only that, but then they have to prove it to me with decreasing time controls. So five minutes, three minutes, and then one minute. One minute only if you're at a certain level, but definitely that's the goal to be able to do it in under a minute. Um, and the, yeah, that's something, it's a practical skill. It's not something, it's not something that you just watch a YouTube video. Does the YouTube video help? Yes, but most people, you do it as a, do as an experiment, give, give somebody a YouTube video and then see if they can do it after. No, it's gonna take a little more than that. Anyways, that's my two sets. No, I, I agree uh, with you there. Yeah. But I mean, personally, I drilled it on ICC, you know, like a 100 mm -hmm. times. And then and then I felt like I could do it. I agree that people need to drill it. I just don't mm -hmm. think the coach has to be there for that. And I'm totally cool if you, you tell your student like, all right, like you show them maybe five minutes, like kind of the key points of the Bishop and Knight Endgame. And mm -hmm. then you're like, your homework is to go and like drill it a bunch of times. And then next week, you'll have to do it like against me in a minute, right? And then you spend like five minutes in a lesson where they like do it in front of you and they show you that they've been practicing or haven't been practicing, you know, whatever. But it's like, to me to spend like that whole hour like on this one end game or other stuff as well, like, um, you know, okay, some students, they really just need help solving simple tactics. But if you're just like drilling simple tactics with the student and it's like not that helpful, it's something they could be doing on their own. 
It's like, yeah, I just don't think that's the best use of that hour. Okay. Uh, David, do you want to get in there before we go? Yeah, I mean, for me, for me, it's, um, I can see where Kosi is coming from, but I think there are sort of like lots of exceptions to, to the idea because I think there's a lot of times where like the coach needs to get in there and figure out why it's not working, right? So, so normally, normally if possible, I would assign things to be done outside of the lesson. Cause I believe, you know, 99% of the work needs to be done outside of the lesson or, or, you know, 97.5%. So, um, so normally I'll try and get them to do stuff outside of the lesson, maybe like do a quick checkup. Okay. They figured it out. Right. But a lot of the time you have to get in there under the hood and figure out what's going wrong with them. Right. So like, the example of like doing puzzles, obviously they should be doing puzzles on their own every day online or whatever, right? But maybe if you have them, like if something's, if you're not sure what's going on, what are their strengths, what are their weaknesses? Why are they at this point or that point? Why do their puzzle ratings not match their blitz ratings or this or that or something like that? Sometimes you just have to get them in there and be like, okay, do, you know, do solve like, you know, puzzle tactics or rushes or whatever online for me while saying out loud what you're thinking for like 10 minutes in the lesson. So you can sort of get in there and figure out what's what's happening with them. Um, same with like Bishop and Knight or, or, or any other example, there could be times where you have to like figure out what the problem is by just being there with it, sort of a mix of reading their mind or having them talk you through stuff. Um, and then finally, there are times where there may be, there may be some material available like easily online for something like I don't know how to checkmate with king and rook against king or something like that, but maybe I have a different way of teaching it than other people. Like maybe I use king and rook versus king as a way to teach the concept of Tsugtsvang to a player of a certain experience level, right? And so I want to do it like my way with my student and like get them to understand something, right? Bishop and knight color complexes, the knight using covering the opposite squares of the bishop and sort of peace coordination. So like if there's other things that you're trying to teach and you've got sort of like a fundamental approach to it and you think it's something your student really needs to get, you don't know for sure if some random YouTube video is going to give it to them with all the concepts and, and the structure that you want for their long term chess development. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I would say there are kind of a lot of exceptions. Um, to the uh, to the rule, I guess another uh, example is just like really really famous games. You know, there's like tons of videos on specific games, and yeah, even then sometimes I feel like mm, the student really needs to see this game right now. <laughs> so let me yeah. just show it to them. Um, yeah. But uh, but like I've taught somebody the opera game before. Yeah, you know, actually even that's a great if game. They wanted to find it. That's they a great go game. Online and find it. <laughs> No, I mean, that's, I think I, I've definitely used it in, in schools. I mean, that's a really instructive game. So, yeah, I can't yeah. say it, it's wrong uh, to to show it. Um, but, okay, I think it depends on the student. Thankfully, I'm not teaching the King and Rook checkmate super often. So it's not, um, not a huge struggle. Yeah. Okay, well, let's do a final quick question. And I'm going to use the king and rook checkmate as my uh, uh, point to connect them. The question is, <clears throat> do you teach all rating levels? For example, the guy I'm taking lessons with, KGB, no, he's not teaching the lower rated student. No, he's not doing it. He's not interested. Um, I have taught every single possible level. And um, one of the things, you know, I did a video, uh, I don't know, about a month ago about how you need a plus, a equal and minus, so somebody better, somebody around the same level, and somebody worse than you, to explain stuff to, to um, really uh, was driven a lot by my experience of teaching all these different levels. And um, for example, ages ago, almost 20 years ago, I, um, pre-online teaching, I coached a elementary school team bottom up and we then ended up, well, I was back in New Mexico and we won like state, uh, the state championship after a year or two. And then we went to nationals and yada, yada. Any case, <laughs> there's a huge difference in quality in how you teach something like the King and Rook checkmate. 
Uh, I learned it, I think, as a kid in a very dumb way where it took me like 30 moves when it should take you about 16 moves. <laughs> Does it make a real difference in a practical game? No, but if you do it correctly, you understand Suksuang and you understand so much more about the game of chess when you do the king and rook checkmate correctly. And um, that's- Sorry, when you say correctly, um, Jesse, how do you mean? <laughs> Um, I mean that you you're uh, you don't the first of all the incorrect way is you do the walk you do the walk <laughs> and then there's like one the night difference with the king and you go all the way to the one side and then you go boop and then you go all the way to the other side and you go boop right and then you go all the way there and you go boop and that's the way I did it when I that's was how most was that's how I learned that's how many people learn yeah is that way yeah and 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 so as, as an example that's a great example no you're doing it wrong. And the student, if they do it that way, will never understand. Well, they'll let, I mean, you can do it that way. Of course, of course you can, but you won't understand Suk Swang and what the end game is about. You won't get it. And we don't have a board, but you know, I could talk at length about that. In any case, uh, I teach all rating levels. I have done anyway. And um, I think it's been beneficial in the long run for my chess to teach the most simple things and being able to express the most simple things and also to be able to express concepts to a whole spectrum of skill levels, right? I have different words for different skill levels, different ways of approaching different concepts for all these different skill levels. And ultimately, at least this would be my hope, <laughs> that that was beneficial for me, both as a teacher and as a player, to be able to express things with different metaphors and ideas to different, uh, you know, audiences, you know? So that's my take on it. Though I don't, the reason I put it out there, I was interested in how you guys felt about it. I know a lot of teachers do not like to teach the very low rated beginners. Yeah, I generally don't work with um, really low rated players. I used to teach in schools, so I would teach people of, of all levels. So I've definitely done it, um, but, when it comes to one-on-one, -on -one, I'm usually working with players that are, uh, I would say, at least 1,200 or higher. And uh, yeah, for me, I don't know. I just um, I'm definitely less experienced at teaching players at lower levels. And I also think it's kind of like, I mean, it's almost like a more important job, like like teaching the fundamentals. And I think it's. Um, I just feel like I haven't really. Uh, studied it enough or deeply enough to really understand like what's the best way to like teach a beginner uh, and so I feel like you actually have a responsibility when you're working with beginners to really start them off on the right the right path and really like kind of think about their long-term uh, you know like physical geometric understanding of the game so that's why I'm with you uh, Jesse on the box method I think it's like it's way cooler uh, and that's what we did with Maya on the channel when I was showing her the the rook, okay. <laughs> the rook mate. Yeah, because I do believe in that one. Um, but uh, yeah, and then okay, there definitely is. Uh, you know, I definitely like working with high rated players because I feel like, you know, looking at their games can be helpful for me. Their games are also interesting, and I can learn new ideas and. Um, yeah, keeps me sharper as well to work with like stronger players. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I think my favorite um, level to teach is kind of like that 14 to 1800 mid range where, you know, people are just beginning to start to appreciate like dynamics and they're learning when it's appropriate to like sacrifice. And yeah, that's when I feel like you really get into the most beautiful parts uh, of chess. So I really kind of you know, I love teaching like the positional sacrifice and um, these kinds of topics that are like really like, you know, fundamental for uh, advanced players, but uh, kind of like for intermediate players are uh, a lot of the big, the big stepping stones to becoming good. Cool. Yeah. So I teach um, most levels, but I don't teach people higher than myself. Um, if somebody higher than me wanted something, I would be confused as to why, um, <laughs> you know, uh, so yeah. And, uh, yeah, I would mostly teach anybody up to, you know, maybe like one or 200 points below me. Um, 
And as far as like uh, beginners or low rated players or little kids, I actually love teaching them, but I don't teach many private lessons to them. So, you know, teaching has different forms, right? And when you make a, a YouTube video, you're, you're teaching people. That's what they're getting out of your video. So um, I don't do a lot of private lessons with people who are more like beginners because what they need is less individualized, right? And so instead I can do sort of like group sessions with them. So I love teaching in schools or camps. I like to be silly with young kids. Um, that's all like great fun for me. It's not, it's not a snobby thing about them not needing it and somebody stronger needing it. It's just, it's, I, I'm perfectly happy to spend time with them, but I don't think that they need individualized instruction as much. So typically for players under 1200, I'll only give them one or maybe two private lessons. Um, and that's generally enough for them to get to 1200 with some time and some practice and so forth. Um, and then of course with group classes, right? And uh, there's lots of content that, that I do that's four players under 1200, uh, which, which they're welcome to. But, but typically like three different 600s without studying their games, I can assume that they're all gonna learn from a certain activity or a certain lesson. And when you get, and as you progress, the higher you progress, the more you need individualized coaching. So the higher rate of the player, the more they need private lessons and, and, and as their form of, of teaching delivery. So. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, cool guys. Justin, did you have anything else to say on that? No, let's end it. That was great. That was really enjoyable. <laughs> All right, awesome. We uh, cut the show there so thanks uh thanks everyone for uh for watching the stream and uh yeah you can catch this episode and previous episodes as well on youtube as well as other uh podcast apps also um okay well i think that is going to wrap it up for the stream i think we're going to rate someone do you either of you guys have any streams coming up jesse what are you doing now that you've completed your your puzzle rush <laughs> challenge <laughs> well first kosti i wanted to make sure that you were okay dude that you you know weren't in the hospital or anything like that you weren't taking any maybe you do need some meds dude maybe you need some meds to just ease the pain a little bit you know after that defeat wow. um, but, <laughs> um no i think tomorrow i'm going to be doing uh uh notes for kgb we had a great lesson today i'm going to try to synthesize in words what the dude told me um but i do need a new quest but mostly I'm finishing these games for my last tournament and then I'm gonna to return to Chessable Quest, I think after I'd finish those games. So Chessable Quest hopefully will return. Cool. Yeah. What about you, David? Do you have any streams coming up? Yeah, I will uh, I'll probably be streaming tomorrow the postmortem at uh, noon Pacific. Okay, very cool. Very cool. Yep. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, I started doing some puzzle rush. I'm going to get Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I'm going to get back in. <laughs> well, no, I, I saw your run, Jesse, and it was like, honestly, like 48 of the easiest problems I've ever seen in my life. So I, Dallian, it, yeah, I think it's just a matter Dallian. of time, but I will there you go, I'll get it back. <laughs> Remember what you said at the beginning of the show, Kosti, about how your time now has an opportunity cost. Yeah, no, it's it's painful. I'm not happy about this, but you know what? I <laughs> I feel reawakened, and uh, I went to the gym yesterday for the first time uh, uh, in weeks, and and yeah. So actually, I think it's a great it's a great motivator. Yeah, I'm I'm pumped. I'm I'm scared. Honestly, I'm scared. <laughs> oh, <scared. laughs> oh, terrifying. <laughs> terrifying well remember this ghost yet if you pick a bad goal in life it's always better to quit along the way than to say i'm all in i'm committed i have to get to this goal that's just going to be a waste of my time right you can just take whatever time you've sunk on it as a sunk cost at any point disengage and improve your life yeah i think <laughs> i think what you're trying to say is even a bad goal is better than no goal. Which no. We all, we all, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, I am saying sometimes when somebody has a goal, they start thinking it's like an immutable law of the universe, right? Because nobody really knows what their meaning is in life or what their purpose is, right? So they like to use some like assumption or some external something to create it for them. That's one of the reasons why people like games, right? Because like the pawn moves this way. You don't have to question it or like what's the meaning of the pawn or me. You just like keep moving your pawns one step at a time and like you know you're doing it right. So you may put this goal in your head of like getting something in Puzzle Rush and then start thinking that's like an axiom of, you know, what's the meaning of your life and how to live in this universe. It's not. It's just a temporary idea you had and you can always move past it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You can't move past it, go see. I am temporarily <laughs> pumped. <laughs> yeah. Temporarily pumped. Uh, so yeah, I might be streaming sometime later uh, this afternoon. We'll. Uh, oh we'll see. dang it, <laughs> oh, dude! It's All on. right, folks, don't encourage our friend. <laughs> Woo. All right, everybody. What, what the next chapter is being written? The next chapter is <laughs> being written right now. <laughs> yeah. Woo. Exactly. Uh, okay, guys. Uh, thanks so much. We'll be uh, rating someone shortly. Have a good one, y'all. All right. Bye-bye.